Dears Indian friends, greetings from Bellitalia 88 and welcome back. I am Caterina Brazzi Castracane, I am an historian and uh, in collaboration with uh, the Italian Culture Center in New Delhi, during this month of October 2020, I will share with you two appointments dedicated to the discovery of the Italian city of Florence. Today, in this first conference, uh, we will try to understand uh, the peculiarities uh, and the more remarkable monuments of that city that is maybe for all of us uh, the perfect postcard from that golden age that is called uh, Renaissance. Actually, we will try to understand what really Renaissance means and why this cultural revolution took place in Florence at the end of the Middle Age. Let's start sharing with you my screen to start with our presentation that today is uh, called Florence, the flourishing city. As you can imagine, the history could be uh, the perfect key to read and to understand the long period of transformation of the places. In uh, this case, the uh, ancient history of uh, Florence uh, is quite similar to the history of uh, other cities that were founded by Romans uh, in different parts of Italy. Uh, Florencia, this was uh, the Latin name gave by Romans uh, to this uh, town, was found in, uh, below the hilltop that was uh, um, already occupied by the presence of the Etruscan town of Fesul. And Florence was laid out as a, a rectangular garrison town. And as you can see in this image, its street formed a pattern of rectangular blocks with a central forum that was used as the main square during the Roman time. Still today, uh, this area is occupied by the historic center of Florence that is uh, since 1982 part of UNESCO heritage. Obviously, talking about uh, the history of Florence uh, is uh, talking about uh, the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Um, even because Florence was occupied several times by outsiders during that period. Uh, first of all, Florence was occupied by Ostrogoths, then by Byzantines, and eventually by Longobard or Lombard. But we have to notice uh, that from the late part of the 10th century, uh, Florence was able to take a rule of first importance, not only in Italy, but also in Europe with the help of some of the protagonists of our political history, in this case uh, the Countess Matilde of Toscany. Uh, the city that we are trying to discover together today became a metropole in the first part of the third century. A metropole with a population of 100,000. I think it's important to remark this aspect because during the same time, Rome, the EU uh, capital of papacy, had a population of 30,000. Florence, despite the bloody strife between the opposing faction of Guelfi and Ghibellini, was able 
to create uh, another form of government and also to have its own uh, golden coin, the Fiorino, that quickly became the most important money in Europe. You have to imagine that the power that uh, the Fiorino had during that time was similar to the power that the American dollar had during the second part of the 20th century. As you are understanding, uh, Florence uh, in that moment uh, realized uh, to have uh, a new form of uh, power, the economical one. And we have to notice uh, that uh, since the 12th century, their guilds uh, were among uh, the most powerful in Europe and also that uh, the Florentines became the uh, most important merchants and bankers for all around the world that uh, was known in that period. Maybe this is one of the reasons why at the end of the 13th century, Florence was ready to become a new kind of capital, a cultural capital, uh, where the idea of rebirth could um, take place to transform all the city in something new. Uh, since that century, the town underwent uh, architectural transformation and uh, became uh, the icon of uh, the humanism and the Renaissance. These uh, movements uh, uh, are related uh, with uh, three fathers uh, of uh, our cultural revolution. Uh, three fathers uh, that spend part of their life uh, in Florence. First of all, Arnolfo di Cambio or Arnolfo di Lapo, the master who transformed the um, outline of Florence. Giotto di Bondone, one of the most remarkable artists in our uh, art history, and Dante Alighieri the master of uh, the uh, huge uh, poem, the Divine Comedy, in this case uh, portrayed by another master of the Renaissance time, Sandro Botticelli, and uh, uh, the man Dante, who found uh, his death far away from Florence, but that uh, he is maybe the most remarkable Florentine of any time. As I was saying, uh, Arnolfo was uh, the master who transformed the outline of Florence. Uh, we uh, are talking about him because he realized uh, the design of uh, the most important buildings, uh, both like and religious, uh, that were realized in Florence during that uh, time. And, uh, his name is important to understand uh, which uh, was uh, the um, architectural revolution that uh, took place in Florence in that period. Uh, together with him uh, we find uh, Giotto di Bondone, the master and maybe one of the father of the modern art. In this case uh, we can admire his uh, um, work uh, just seeing uh, this uh, uh, crocifisso that is a, a masterpiece uh, house inside the church of uh, Santa Maria Novella and we are going to talk about this uh, church. Uh, the power of uh, Giotto was the power uh, to uh, be the man who transform uh, painting uh, in something modern.
full of energy, patience and feelings uh, as after him will do all the other artists. And uh, finally, the father of the Italian language, Dante Alighieri, that is here represented in a fresco by Domenico di Michelini, realized for the uh, Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore at the end of the 15th century. And uh, uh, this fresco is uh, interested because uh, uh, just display a sort of metaphysical representation of Dante, its poem and uh, the different uh, plays that uh, were uh, uh, that were related with uh, him. First of all, Dante is uh, here represented, um, surrounded by the uh, place uh, and the location where uh, he um, uh, realized the idea inside the um, comedy, the hell, the uh, Mount of Purgatory with the figures of Adam and Eve on the top and also the uh, sky that is the perfect representation of the heaven, uh, the third book of the comedy that is uh, he here represented also with the star and the sun. But Dante is uh, represented um, near the huge uh, representation of Florence that from that time uh, is uh, remarked by the same skyline of today. You can notice this aspect just seeing this picture of Florence taken by uh, the other part of the reader Arno in Piazzale Michelangelo and you can notice that uh, this skyline is remarked by the presence of the uh, tower of the uh, Palazzo Vecchio and also by the bell tower of the cathedral. Palazzo Vecchio in particular was realized by a design of Arnolfo di Cambio and was realized to be uh, the uh, most important uh, palace for the government of the city. Uh, today it's important to notice that this architectural design is called Tosco Gothic and is one of the peculiarities of this kind of style that was realized in Florence. Near Piazza della Signoria you uh, can find find the huge religious complex of the cathedral dedicated to uh, Santa Maria del Fiore, the uh, Holy Virgin. In this case, uh, the uh, church was realized by the hand uh, first of all of uh, Arnolfo di Cambio in the same place where the uh, original cathedral of Florence Santa Reparata stood. Uh, the complex was finished around 1367 and uh, the cathedral was completely covered by the colored marbles that uh, still today are one of the symbolic elements that uh, told us which was the idea of rebirth, something modern, something uh, colored, something beautiful. Uh, this complex uh, is uh, formed by different uh, elements and buildings. First of all, the huge bell tower that is the masterpiece uh, realized by the hand of uh, Giotto and after him by Andrea Pisano and Francesco Talenti. Mm, those uh, uh, men realized uh, 
a perfect uh, representation of uh, the um, Tower Bell that was uh, realized also to be the link between the earth and the sky. But uh, we have to notice uh, that uh, there is a, a sort of dialogue between the elements that are part of this uh, complex because you can notice that in the other part uh, of uh, the square that dominated uh, the uh, part in front of the cathedral you can find another interested uh, architectural uh, realization the baptistry of saint john that was uh, for several times believed by Florentine as a Roman pagan temple that was converted into a church. In this case you can see that uh, the style of this building um, is uh, the uh, true representation of the idea of uh, the perfect uh, geometrical building of Renaissance and also that uh, the um, baptistry is, is uh, uh, remarkable for the presence of the bronze doors. In particular, the East One was realized by the master Lorenzo Ghiberti and uh, was uh, so beauty that uh, was named by the master Michelangelo as the gates of paradise. All that uh, buildings are part uh, of the main church that uh, um, had the peculiarities that uh, um, had no uh, doom until the 15th century. In uh, 1418 actually was held a competition to find a new designer for uh, the dam. The the competition was won by the great master uh, Filippo Brunelleschi, who realized uh, his uh, starting point of the new era of the Renaissance, had done with a design uh, self supporting that from that moment became the never ending icon of Florence. We have to say that uh, this is the huge achievement of Filippo Brunelleschi and that uh, with them the cathedral was consecrated by the presence of Pope Eugenio IV Condulmer on 1436. That time was uh, the uh, turning point of the history of Florence that from that time was also remarked by the present uh, as uh, the uh, most important family of the city of the dynasty of Medici. But before talking to the power of Medici, we have to imagine that the same area of uh, Piazza della Signoria and the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore was uh, transformed during the same period in the area uh, dedicated to the presence of the religious order. First of all, the Dominicans uh, that uh, were present with the church of Santa Maria Novella and then um, remarked by the presence of the Franciscan that were present there with the church of Santa Croce. The only church of uh, Santa Maria Novella is maybe the monument of Renaissance art. And we have to say that all the artists of that period work on it to transform this church in a sort of religious museum. Uh, 
One of the most remarkable part of this church is the facade that was realized during the 15th century by the hand of another great master of this period, Leon Battista Alberti, who uh, found uh, the money from uh, one of the richest family of Florence, the Rucellai, and who had the idea to create something modern um, that could be visible from outside of the church. He realized this facade and he realized it um, just to create something that could be a new kind of art full of elements taken from the east and from the west and able to um, redeclinate the uh, name of Christianity. It's important to notice that Leon Battista Alberti had participated to the Concilio di Ferrara and Firenze. And uh, uh, this council is important because uh, even if it uh, uh, was uh, short-lived, uh, try to reunion the uh, Latin and the Greeks church. And this is important to understand which was the aim of Leon Battista Alberti. Try to put together the uh, different example of art that uh, are the um, symbol of Christianity in both uh, the part of the world. In this case, you can see the details that are uh, represented on the facade. First of all, the baby Jesus inserted in a flaming solar disk that was the symbol of the Dominicans. You can see this symbol on the top of the facade in this position, but also you can see the uh, family crest of Rucellai that is part of this huge decoration. Not only um, artistical subjection, because also the time measurement tools of Ignazio Danti were realized uh, to find the right place on the facade. Danti is a master, but he was also a Domenical monk. He is uh, well known because uh, he um, was able to uh, demonstrate uh, the discrepancy between the solar year and the calendar that were uh, in use during that time. And he was the man who uh, helped the Pope Gregorio XIII Boncompagni to introduce the new calendar that from the Pope, the pope takes uh, its name. In the other corner of the city, uh, you find the symbol of the Franciscan presence in Florence, Santa Croce, that is uh, also remarkable for the uh, masters that work on it. But uh, the importance of Santa Croce is related uh, with the idea to be the pantheon of uh, the great Florentine uh, writer, artist, and also patriots. Um, the church um, contains the tombs of uh, the huge and important men of any time. First of all, the tomb of Michelangelo and Galileo, but also the tomb of uh, Machiavelli, Ghiberti, and also the musician Rossini. 
um, we have to say that uh, this church was called uh, the temple of the Italian glory by the great writer Ugo Foscolo, who um, wrote uh, in the first part of the 19th century uh, a poem called I Sepolcri, uh, where he described uh, the glory of Italy just uh, seeing and talking about uh, the tomb of them that are housed inside Santa Croce. There is just one great absent, Dante. Because, uh, I, as I was uh, saying before, Dante found his death in Ravenna and uh, his tomb is uh, still uh, present in that city of the north of Italy, inside uh, Santa Croce. There is just uh, a cenotaph, but uh, Foscolo told uh, as uh, about the cenotaph uh, talking uh, um, of Dante has the Ghibellin Fuggiasco. Uh, from uh, this point and this moment with uh, this uh, skyline, Florence uh, became the huge and important city of the Medici family. That dynasty that maybe is synonymous of Florence, that in this case is presented to us by Benozzo Gozzoli with a celebrated fresco uh, realized for Palazzo Medici Riccardi, La Cavalcata dei Magi, that is uh, just a huge representation of the power of that family that uh, ruled uh, the power for uh, three centuries. The dynasty of uh, the Medici is uh, remarkable for uh, some member of them. First of all, Cosimo the Elder, that is called the Patrier Patrie. But uh, after him, Lawrence the Magnificent and also Cosimo the First, uh, that was the first Grand Duke of Tuscany, and Cosimo the Second. Uh, the mm, masterpiece of the dynasty was uh, realized uh, a city that was ready to become the perfect icon of modernity. And uh, in particular, during uh, the um, government of Lawrence the Magnificent, you have to imagine that Florence was a joyful and happy town, full of creativity and imagination. Lorenzo il Magnifico was not only a statement, but was also all, um, but was uh, also a man full of culture. Uh, he was a poet and he uh, used to uh, manage the government of the city using the artist and their masterpiece to create new relations with the other countries. He was able to transform the idea of Florence has uh, the huge cultural capital of all the world and from that period Florence became the city that still today uh, we noticed and well known. But not just Lorenzo Il Magnifico, because also Cosimo I was a member of this dynasty uh, with the great idea to, uh, gave, to give to Giorgio Vasari the work to realize a new palace, the Uffizi palace to house one part of the office of the government. The name Uffizi uh, just remember has the Italian word Uffizi, the English word of office. Giorgio Vasari realized for 
the uh, great uh, Grand Duke of Tuscany, also the corridor that uh, linked the Uffizi Palace to the new residence of the Medici family, Palazzo Pitti. And uh, uh, after the last part of the 16th century, uh, the works uh, were finished by another uh, artist, Bernardo Buontalenti. Uh, this uh, huge and important uh, building is uh, related and still uh, remarkable for the present of the Medici masterpiece collection that were um, housed inside one part of this building since the time of uh, Francesco I that set up a private gallery with status and other different kind of objects. Um, Anna Maria Luisa de Medici, the last of the Medici dynasty, uh, declared that uh, the Uffizi Gallery was a uh, uh, public heritage. And this is uh, the reason why the uh, museum in 1769 opened to the public. From that time, the uh, Uffizi Gallery um, are, because we have to uh, talk about uh, this museum in a plural form, one of the most uh, important museums in the world. And uh, I uh, make uh, uh, for you um, a selection of uh, masterpieces that are housed inside this museum to understand which is the peculiarities of this museum and also which uh, was the aim of the collectionism of that time. First of all, the first masterpiece that is housed inside the uh, Uffizi Museum is uh, The Birth of Venus by Sandro Botticelli, realized at the end of the 15th century. Um, is a masterpiece uh, probably uh, commissioned by a member of the Medici family. We uh, know it uh, by the present uh, of uh, in representation of uh, an orange tree that is related with uh, the name of this family. Botticelli in this case uh, takes uh, his uh, inspiration from classical statue for Venice's modest pose and uh, is uh, something that could really let us understand which was uh, the aim uh, of uh, this master uh, or, or actually to uh, realize uh, something that could talk um, both at, at the same time the language of the past with the language of modernity. In this case, the modernity is still uh, displayed uh, by the uh, wonderful body of Venus. After Botticelli, Giorgio Vasari, that we um, um, the men who uh, we uh, were talking about uh, the construction of the building, but that in this case uh, realized a perfect portrait uh, of Lawrence the Magnificent and uh, who realized uh, the perfect icon of uh, these uh, men that uh, was uh, um, the uh, considerate uh, just uh, in during that time the father of uh, our art and maybe the father of uh, a new humanity completely um, full of uh, uh, the relation between the art and a new kind of government. You can uh, read uh, the Latin inscription that is the perfect uh, 
um, idea and representation of a man that is considered as a saint for the art. This uh, uh, masterpiece uh, is maybe the most uh, well-known uh, of uh, this uh, collection. This is uh, the representation of the Annunciation uh, by Leonardo and uh, is uh, something that uh, um, could uh, perfect uh, represent uh, the ideal uh, world thought by the Renaissance artist. The scene, the scene of uh, the Annunciation uh, to the the Holy uh, Virgin Mary is uh, um, displayed inside uh, an enclosed garden that is uh, uh, considered the perfect ortus conclusus of the medieval tradition uh, of uh, gardening. In this case, uh, the garden is uh, the symbol of uh, the purity of uh, Mary and uh, is uh, a perfect representation of the, an ideal word uh, that uh, could uh, be um, link the heaven and the word of God and uh, the word that uh, the um, artists in that period are trying to um, create uh, in the world. In this case, uh, the masterpiece uh, arrived to the Uffizi Gallery at the end of the 19th century and was taken from the uh, church of uh, San Bartolomeo Monteliveto but we uh, don't know uh, anything about uh, his original location. After Leonardo the most important artist of that period is Michelangelo and in this case he realized a perfect view of the Holy Family and he realized this painting for the marriage of one of the richest men of Florence, Agnolo Doni, and the noble human Maddalena Strozzi. Michelangelo is the master of uh, the David, but also the man who will work uh, to the project of the Sistine Chapel. He is uh, uh, a sculptor and we can see that in this case he uh, realized a painting that is uh, um, remarked by the present of a lot of different details taken from the word of the uh, ancient sculptor and also from the antiquity in general. Look uh, to the Holy Virgin Mary and look to her arms that are uh, some of the wonderful representation of uh, the real body that we can see. In this case it is important to notice that also the frame was designed by Michelangelo but realized by Francesco del Tasso. The trinity of uh, the uh, Renaissance artist is composed basically um, of Leonardo, Michelangelo and Raphael, the painter called Master, as we have already seen in another conference. In this case, the self-portrait is important to notice that um, Raphael was also a proud painter of that time. We can notice uh, is, uh, it because he is uh, here wearing his scene simple work attire that you can see and recognize with this white line. This self-portrait is a part of a private collection uh, of painters 
um, of portraits of painters painted by their own hand that was collected by another member of the Medici family, Leopoldo de Medici. Uh, after them, I would like to share with you one of the most uh, tender icon of that age, the angel playing the lute by Rosso Fiorentino. Um, this is just a fragment of a lost altarpiece, but you can see um, all the peculiarities of this um, scene that is full of love and um, romantic details that are here used to um, let us see these small angel like a child that he's just handle these instruments that is maybe too big for him also this kind of um, tender is present inside the cultural revolution of Renaissance. And this is one of the other uh, reasons why still today that movement told uh, us a word of uh, grace and power. But I want to uh, go to the end of uh, our conference uh, sharing with you this uh, last masterpiece uh, that is present in the Uffizi Gallery. Uh, the great representation of uh, the, bi the biblical uh, theme of uh, the um, Judith that uh, he is uh, beheading uh, Olofern that was realized by uh, Artemisia Gentileschi one of the most important uh, human artists who worked uh, between the 15th and the 16th century. This masterpiece was realized to the Grand Duke uh, Cosimo II and uh, is uh, the perfect icon of uh, that transformation started with Caravaggio in Rome that uh, will be uh, the other important aspect of uh, the uh, history of art of that period that is called Baroque. In this case, uh, you um, cannot find anything that was so simple and related with the classical theme that was realized by Sandro Botticelli or the others, but you can feel and see the uh, painting that is full of energy, full of details and full of reality. You have to notice the eyes of Olofern that are the eyes of a man that is in front of his death in that moment and that is represented as uh, the word that death uh, by the hand of another female heroine that is able to create another kind of world. But Artemisia was not the only human that is important to remember uh, because we can discover together the uh, important singer and musician uh, Francesca Caccini that grew up uh, uh, and worked in Florence as a musician for the Medici family. She uh, realized different kind of composition uh, that was uh, important for that time but that are still 
still important to understand which was also the um, musical um, ambient that uh, was uh, so typical of the uh, Florentine court of that period. This is the reason why I choose to end this first appointment hearing with you one of the most remarkable dance uh, from that period is uh, called the Chaccona and uh, is uh, um, one of uh, still today most important uh, composition by Francesca Cecchini. Bye.